All right, here we go. All right, welcome to What Do You Know with Scott and Arnie here on KGVO. Arnie, how you doing? You know, I'm back from a round-the-world trip. I'm excited to be back because we have a great guest on our show today. I can name We up. have a singer, songwriter, guitarist, storyteller, sailor, Scott Kirby. I haven't seen Scott in 30 years. And uh, he, I knew he was uh, coming uh, to Montana. He's uh, He's got a girlfriend uh, who lives in Livingston, and he was coming to Missoula. And I said, we got to grab him to bring him on the show. Scott has... A very interesting story, and I'm not going to steal it all from him, but I'm going to tell you one small piece, and it's it fulfills almost every man's fantasy. <laughs> at some point, <laughs> at some Where point... Where are we going guy, with this? Uh, well, you'll hear very quickly. At some point in every guy's life, you know, it certainly happened to me, and I'm sure it's happened to you. At some point, you're so fed up with the humdrum <laughs> of everyday existence, of, you know, the relationship you're in, your boss at work, you say, I just want to junk it all and go to Key West, Florida, and open a bar and live the Margaritaville life, right? I mean, right. I, you know, Jimmy Buffett has a huge following because he he feeds into that great fantasy. You can just go down, you know, and, you know, cheeseburgers in paradise and, you know, drink, you know, drink all night and, you know, relax and, you know, wear flip-flops and all that kind of stuff. And Scott Kirby did that. And, you know, he'll tell the story, his how he meandered all the way down to Key West. But he left, you know, when I knew him 30 years ago, he was in a political uh, career. He was working in New Hampshire, uh, you know, uh, do, doing political work. He worked on political campaigns. And then last, the next thing I heard, he's down in Key West. He's got a bar called the Smoking Tuna Saloon. <laughs> he's performing all over the United States. And now he's meandered his way here to Missoula. And we have him on the show today. He's, I mean, we, this is uh, royalty. We have music royalty here. I mean, eight albums. He has eight CDs out. He has right. some great songs. He's a storyteller. To me, he's 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 our version today of sort of a Harry Chapin-esque kind of uh, storyteller, singer, songwriter. Introduce yourself, Mr. So, Kirby. So here he is, Scott well, Kirby. Great to be here. Appreciate you guys inviting me. Well, we're happy to have you. We really are. How? Yeah. What road took you here? How did you get here today? Where? Where have you? Where came, were you beforehand? I, I was in Livingston last night, the lovely town of Livingston, and okay. I came from Key West a few days ago. Well, he's got Real? the tan. You yes. can tell the tan. He doesn't look like us, like pale I'm zombies. I'm here for twelve days, uh, working on some new songs and and, and uh, working on putting my summer tour together, which starts in April. Let but. me ask you something. Just right. In, just uh, we're going to be very spontaneous over this Absolutely. next hour. I'm, so I was just listening to Billy Joel on the Billy Joel station on Sirius, and he was just saying that a lot of his songs come to him. He wakes up from a sleep, and he's been there's a, a melody in his in his um, head. There's a, a catchphrase that you know that that's on his mind, yes, and he right. goes to his piano and starts working. On it. Does that happen to that you? That does happen. And my friend Mac McAnally, who's a sure, fan, phenomenal Mac. songwriter and a good friend of mine, he says that. These songs actually are just floating around the universe every night, three, four, five o'clock in the morning, and just it's just a matter of who's actually awake at the time to receive them. So yeah, I like he, that. And if he is struggling to write a bridge to a song or some section of a song, he he goes to bed concentrating. I need a bridge. I need a bridge. Really? He says That's... almost every single time that time we all get up at five in the morning, and you know. He, it almost always comes to him. Well, you, you hear these interview shows over, you know, right. uh, uh, and you hear people like Paul McCartney and Elton John and Billy Joel talk about writing their most famous song like in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. They wake up, there's almost a complete song sometimes in their head. And it, it has to be what, you know, Mac has said. They're floating around in the universe, and somehow they've intersected with the uh, with somebody willing to receive it the is, message. And I certainly don't want to put myself on the level of, of those guys as far as great songwriters. But it, that process does happen to me, and it, it is true. It, sometimes a song takes a year, and other times you sit down, something comes to your mind, the chords just flow out, the, the, the lyrics pour onto the page. and it's. I've written probably 110 songs, and that has happened probably five or six times in, in one or two sittings. It's and it's been a, a you know. You, so how did the song "It's Hard to Find a Hooker on Valentine's Day" come to your mind? Or can this we is talk an about that? Absolutely true story. <laughs> um, 
One I, of my favorite <laughs> songs of Scott's. It's a great I was, title. I was uh, back in New Hampshire in the uh, 2002 or three, working, playing 100 shows on the road a year, but I went back for two years to serve as an assistant secretary of state for a friend of mine. He, he coaxed me into coming back. So I was in New Hampshire in February, and my assistant, Terry, called me on the phone. It was Valentine's Day. And uh, she called, and I said, Happy Valentine's Day. She said, Happy Valentine's Day to you. What are you doing today? Are you going to, you going to get a hooker? <laughs> and I and I was married at the time, and I said, I said, No, it's it's really hard to find a hooker on Valentine's Day. And she just started howling, <laughs> laughing, and I realized, I think I'm, I might have something. And I, I ran into my friend Roger Guth, who's Jimmy Buffett's drummer and a phenomenal songwriter. And I, I said, I've got this idea to write a song called It's Hard to Find a Hooker on Valentine's Day. And he goes, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> great because title. it's very ironic. And I took a lot of heat for it from various members of my family at the time. Right. And a f- about a year later... The governor of New York, Elliot Spitzer, had a little problem. Right. <laughs> and the last he time he ended up being with the hooker was on February 13th. And this is absolutely true. Why? Because it's hard to find a hooker well, on Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. I was be on a day before. I was vindicated. You, let me ask you a question. Back to the songwriting process. You know, when the door opens, it opens and you walk right through. But do you keep a, a tape recorder or right now an iPhone or something next to your bed, a notebook? I, or you go to sleep and say it'll come back if it's worth I, it. I've come lost back. a few songs in in the years past by not having the discipline, a not having the discipline to get up and write it down, or b thinking I would actually remember it in right. the morning. So yeah, I always have a, a notepad or an iPhone close by, and uh, when something like that happens, when afraid, isn't that interesting? Yes. So how that? did you have the guts? I mean, wimps like us don't. How did you have the guts to give it all up and go to Key West and do that? A, a, a quick background on my situation. Yeah, tell I, us I your was, backstory, uh, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was. Uh, this would have been. I, I went to Key West in 1988. Um, I started working in. I played in a little band in high school, right. and uh, so I learned to play the guitar. Self-taught, completely self-taught. It, you know, as a teenager, never had a lesson, and uh, uh, played in a little band in my early 20s. Then I got. Who were your influences, by the way? Who were your influences growing Definitely up? Definitely the, the 70s people, the 70s singer-songwriter class. I mean, James Taylor and Harry Chapin, right. you mm-hmm. know, Crosby. I was an acoustic guy, even when I, I, I never really was an electric guitar player. You're a self-taught acoustic complete, guy. Complete, completely self-taught. I see Shel Silverstein was also one of your uh, one Yes, of your I, I knew him a little bit. He, 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 I, he said some very encouraging words to me one night, and... Uh, but yeah, pretty much that you? was the class of my my inspiration, right. you know. And then I later on, I you know discovered Jimmy Buffett. I thought he was a, his his early CDs were unbelievable and a great yeah. lyricist, great storyteller, and and almost created his own genre of you know songs. And uh, so those were my influences. And then uh, then I got involved in politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother was very involved in politics, as was my grandmother. So I got involved in a campaign was kind of at this point in my life where I was a bit lost in my early mid-20s. Ended up be- managing three or four campaigns, United States Senate governor. Ended up teaching myself how to r- produce radio and TV spots. And then I went through this eight or nine years of this, and it was during the Reagan administration. So I was managing Democrats, so it was a really tough time. And I was sick of the cold in New Hampshire. I was in I was 31, 32 years old and hadn't owned a guitar in eight years. Wow. And it, I tell this to people all the time. It wasn't any any courage or anything extraordinary. I was not in a good spot. I I was kind of getting depressed, and I was yeah. Well, you the know, cold in the winter in New, New Hampshire just, will do that too. It was just in, in a bad spot, and I, I I I bought another guitar and I started putting together a a, a repertoire and. One night in the middle of the night, I, I woke up with a legal pad and I wrote down all my expenses. And I was I was single and I wrote down all my expenses and I said, you know, I think I can if I can get down there and get three gigs a week for six months, I can survive. And I, I, I was the chief of staff of the minority leader of the New Hampshire legislature at the time. I went in the next day and gave her my notice, two months' notice, and I got in my car on a Thanksgiving weekend and went down to Key yeah. West. Never came back. Well, and a week later, I had. Have you ever I, been to Key West before? Yes, I had. I knew yeah. I'd been two or three times, and I'd kind of fallen in love with it at the time and made a few musical contacts. And 
I went down there, and my first audition was at a, a hotel down there called the Pier House, kind of a famous sure. place. And I went in and set my sound system up and played for half an hour, and the food and beverage manager said, you're hired, start next week, uh, seven shows a week. What and I, I looked at thing. how I great said, is that? You know, politics doesn't pay a great amount of money, but I was the chief of staff at the state house. Right. All of a sudden, I'm making my first paycheck for a week of playing the guitar was more than I was making in a fairly responsible position with a state of New person staff in the, in the state house. So, yeah. so I was very lucky. I mean, luck. <laughs> and you ate for free and you drank for free. <laughs> right. So, was that the inspiration <laughs> for your song, Lucky Enough? <laughs> No, I wrote a song way back then called Lucky Man, actually. Right. Way back, one of my first or second songs. Lucky enough, I wrote uh, when I w had gone back to New Hampshire right. and I was living part-time in Key West and part-time at this cottage on the coast of New Hampshire. And I'm, right. I'm saying to myself one day, who's luckier than, Me. than I am? And, and I, I don't remember where I wrote that song or writing. It's it's my most popular, probably and well known song. Right. It gets a ton of airplay on, on satellite radio, and but uh, that's that's really what inspired me. To, sure. Do you want to do that song for us now? I'll, I'm in a, I'm in the wrong tuning to do it, but it'll take me two seconds Let's to retune. Say, take the it because we can we can take a break Let's, and. Well, you know what we'll do. I want to keep on here. I want to hear a little more more about your story, okay? okay? Because I think that's interesting. Then we can get into some songs. Sure. But I'm curious to know. Um, so you go down to Key West and you're and you're doing seven days, you know, seven sh gigs a, a week. You're making great money. What then gave you the confidence to then say, you know, I should take this on the road? I, you know, I can't. Was it a series of activities that said, hey, you know what? In the off season, maybe I can go go to the resort. I mean, what was your well? I spent six your idea. I spent six months there, and I'm at this point, I'm not a songwriter. I'm doing all cover material. Right. Okay. Um, and who were you covering at that time? James I was Taylor. covering a, a James Taylor, Harry Chapin. I mean, Cat Stevens, Jimmy Buffett, John right. Prine. I mean, um, you know, those all kind the of, good guys from yeah, the 70s. All, all those kind of folks. And um, I spent six months and I said, okay, it's time to go north. And then I got an offer to go to Bermuda. A friend of mine said, this, this club owner in Bermuda really needs someone to play for a, a month. Can you go to Bermuda? And I said, well, I'd love to go to Bermuda. Wow. Off to Bermuda. Spent five, ended up spending six months in Bermuda, and then it was time to go back to Key West. And so I went back to Key West for winter two, mm -hmm. and I said to myself, okay, this will be my last winter doing this. I, this has been my year away, you know. You were going to go back I'm to New Hampshire? I'm going back to Key West for one more winter and then go back to the real world. Okay. Right. I go back to Key West for the second winter, and I started to pick away at writing some songs. And then... Jimmy Buffett had just hired a new band, three young guys from St. Louis, Peter Mayer, Jim Mayer, and Roger Guth. And I saw them play at his club. They were in town recording a new CD with him. And I would go down there occasionally and watch them. We became friends, and um, they're amazing musicians, all very schooled. And, and Peter became a big inspiration to me and um, – Helped me with my, my you know songwriting, and within a year, I was doing my first CD in Jimmy Buffett's studio. So once I what a break. another lucky break, and now uh, you actually have have cut some recordings with uh, Peter Mayer, haven't you? Pete and I have written six or seven songs together. We just did a new CD uh, together. We tour every September jointly, and right. we've. Uh, What's the name of the thing. CD? CD for your uh, it's called the Cast the Kai Away. So I've actually brought you a copy. It's oh, in the good, good. Yeah. Hey, Terrific. if you're just tuning in, you're listening to What Do You Know with Scott Narni, and, and we have guest Scott Kirby in the studio, singer, songwriter, extraordinaire, and swashbuckler from Key West, Sailor, Sailor. Sailor. So keep going. So then, this is 1989. That would be. Uh, let's see. This is. Uh, this would be like 19, my second season, so 1990. Okay. Um, and. This really motivated motivated me to write my first batch of songs, and and uh, I knew uh, I knew Jimmy Buffett's uh, production assistant, and he talked to Jimmy and said, uh, you know, he's got a new guy in town that's written some good songs. How about letting mm -hmm. him use the studio? So he had a great studio down there, and JL engineered it, and uh, that was my first. And Peter and Roger and Jim played on a lot of the cuts, so. 
Oh my I god! I go to I go to Key West a year and a half later. I'm in Jimmy's studio with his <laughs> with a core of his band recording my own CD. It's pretty. Lucky. People would die to kill for this, right? Well, and let's just for everyone in this, everyone in our audience, let's frame it up for them. Jimmy Buffett is Key West, right? So he, in the terms of like having at that point, he is so synonymous with Key West and with that style of music. That's his town, and so you're immediately getting to one of the highest levels of access. Yes, and I mean, I had met him a couple times. I didn't know him well, but um, I know he did come in one day when I wasn't there and listen to a song or two of mine and seemed to, seemed to like it. And uh, but yeah, he and now this was this was I think even before he exploded into this really huge. It was he was what on his, I always wonder that because I we used to see him or my family used to see him at the uh, at the you know he used to do all the sheds in the summer in the yes. northeast and around the country for that matter still doing yeah, yeah. Sure. still doing but it was it he wasn't doing that in the night he he was he was doing the sheds I would say that he just didn't have the restaurant he was just and, starting to do because uh, I remember seeing him in uh, eighty seven eighty eight and he was doing. Still doing like three or four thousand seat places. Okay. So he was okay. just on this this huge trajectory, trajectory right. doing sheds and now stadiums. I mean, it's, right. it's and, and you've toured with him. I've opened for him. Yeah. A, a few times. Where and, have you opened? What what types I, uh, of venues? And well, in, in his club in in Key sure. West, and actually, uh, actually last September, Peter and I were playing at the Stephen Talk House out on Long Island. Right. A great legendary small venue. Right. And Jimmy. Lives close by. He came in and played half the show with us, so that was fun. Oh, Is that right? Great. Yeah. Oh, you must have some great yeah. stories. We got to get to all those. You're listening to What Do You Know with Scott and Arnie. We have Scott Kirby in the studio. So now we're in the mid. We're in the mid '90s, right? So what do you do? What, how does this? But you decided that you, you had your two years and you didn't go back, right? You, you get, no, I, meeting meeting Peter and then starting to write. Then I realized, well, I'm. This is what I think I'm going to be doing for a while, and uh, and then I think '92 <clears throat> might have been the first year that I went out on the road in the summer and tried to play, you know, try to go out and play some places outside of Key West. So I think '92, '93 is when I first did my little, my first little East Coast tour of ten or fifteen dates and really small crowds. And where did you go? Do you remember? Oh, uh, I played in South Carolina and I played in. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, and in New York, Connecticut, some places in Massachusetts, you know, New Hampshire. So you worked your way up the coast. Worked my way up the coast. And then I think uh, in in 90, 90, I did my first full blown CD in 92, I think. Then I did then I did my second one in 95, if I recollect correctly. And, and then every year the touring expanded. And now I do about 75 one nighters, you know, all That's over the incredible. country. But you know, you at that time, actually, in the early '90s, you had the the wherewithal to know that songwriting was going to be is one of the ways to really grow your career and also build your build your library of intellectual property. You know, right? I'm a I can I can play the guitar reasonably. I mean, I'm a I'm a I play like not as well as James Taylor, but that type of style. I can accompany myself. I'm a finger mm -hmm. style player. I'm, I've never was blessed with a, a, a good voice. In fact, the band I played in. In my early twenties, they wouldn't let me sing. So I mean, this, the singing part is, you know, this was not did not come naturally for me. And uh, but I did realize that you can play cover songs, and there are there are tens of thousands of people in this country and, right. that are amazing singers and guitar players. But if you're playing your own material, no one really does your own song more authentically than you do. So right. if you can play and sing reasonably well and you have songs that grab people then right. that's a that's a that's a path to go out and make more than you know 150 dollars a show like or 200 dollars a show sure. which all you can make playing cover tunes so it was it was the best decision i ever made and that's when i ran into shell silverstein one night wow uh, he, i knew him because he used to sit and listen to me play but i did not know him well, and he was a very quiet guy. Where was with, this in Key in West? In Key West, he uh, the the pier house where I played. He that was his hangout. He would sit on the he was really? sit, yeah he would sit on the beach Did there. Did he live there or he lived in Miami? He lived in Key West. I didn't know that. Yeah, he lived in Key West, and and he came to the pier house beach every day with his legal pad, and he he sat there in his chair on the beach and worked always writing something down. Right. And for, for our listeners, Scott uh, Richmond, tell them who Shell Silverstein is. 
God, we, we, some people he's might not so know. Right. Singer songwriter, and I just I came across and. Do you know that he's a co-writer? I think I hope I state this correctly. I came across a YouTube video of he of Shel Silverstein and Johnny Cash doing a boy a, uh, a, boy, a boy named, named Sue? Sue a boy named Sue. He, he wrote was, that. He yeah, wrote, he wrote that. that. Yeah, and you've got to see it on YouTube. And he wrote children's books. I mean, he did a lot of interesting children's books. Stuff. He was a cartoonist. He he wrote a co -wrote prolific a, prolific, and I believe he wrote. Almost every song that uh, Doctor Hook and the Medicine Show. Oh, is I, that I right? He wrote most of those songs. So you know better than yeah. I. I just know Shoal Silverstein from my Johnny Cash uh, interest. Yeah, right. and a, quite a famous children's author. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I remember all of his books. I mean, he was unbelievably prolific. <laughs> but I, one night in the little club I played, uh, it was midnight and it was closed. I was sitting there by myself waiting for a ride, and he he walked by at about midnight and he stopped and he said, "You're having a little time for yourself." And I had my guitar out and. I said, yeah, I'm just waiting for a ride. And he said, you know, I've been listening to you for last year or two, and I, I noticed you're starting to play some of your own material. I said, yeah, I'm really trying to, you know, trying to write some songs. And he said, well, you know, if you, if you go down that road of writing your own material, people will respect you a lot more, and you'll have a lot more respect for yourself. And he, that's all he said, and he wow. walked off into the night, wow. and that, you know, I never forgot that's that. That's pivotal. So, yeah. Scott, we got, I got to take a you're, what are you tuned to play now? I want to hear a song. I, I, I'm tuned right now to play Morning in Montana. That's his new song he's written, Morning in Montana. Well, what was the inspiration for Morning in Montana? Yes. Well, Livingston, you know, sits in the valley Beautiful. there in the in the shadow of three mountain ranges, and the, the mornings there are just amazing. And, uh, I, I uh, you know, it's in the shadow of the crazy mountains. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I like to joke that when I'm in Key West, I'm living in the shadow of the crazies. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm in Livingston, I'm in the shadow of the real crazies. Right. But, and it's just, just the beauty of Shout Montana and the, you know. <laughs> that's so really what, what grab, so. grab your guitar and let's, right. let's hear, let's let our, let our listeners hear for the first time your, uh, your new uh, song, Morning in Montana. You make sure, you make, bring your mic over to him. Yeah, I'm going to bring my mic over to you so you can oh, uh, have yep. this down here. Yeah, that's nice. Monitor, monitor. All right, here we go. Little train song. The rolling of the river. Wailing of the train, whisper of that valley wind, calling my name. And that Rocky Mountain sunrise, bringing in the day. Well, I came alive one morning, lying on the ground. At the edge of rock bottom with those mountains gazing down And if I hadn't found you, Lord knows where I'd be bound And the crazies seem to keep my blues away Another big sky, big smile day yeah, the river winds its way to drown the pain Hey, hey, show me the way And the dream of midnight snow begins to end Well, it's morning in Montana again A long road to get here, a hundred miles a day It only took one sunrise, now I'm gonna stay And I came so very far, man, to get this very far away. Yeah, the crazies seem to keep my blues away. They're another big sky, big smile day. Hey, the river winds its way to drown the pain. Hey, hey, show me the way. And the dream of midnight snow begins to end. Well, it's morning in Montana again. It was 
strange to find myself in the bar of lost and found at the edge of the river in this steel horse town but i landed on my feet in this land of hallow ground yeah the crazy seemed to keep my blues away Another big sky, big smile day. Yeah, the river winds its way to drown the pain. Hey, hey, show me the way. Hey, the dream of midnight snow begins to end. Well, it's morning in Montana. Again. It's a keeper, Scott Kirby. Hey, you, you might. This might be the new. This might be the new uh, state song. Okay, <laughs> state oh, I'm song for, to Steve for Bullock country. country. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a good song. I want to. You know, I want to bring that over to Kiss FM. We should open with that. That's a. Uh, That's a great open. song. Scott, congratulations! You've wrote uh, you've written, written. Listen to me. You've written a winner. You got a fan now. Here. You got another, got another My voice fan here. Woke up halfway through the song, but that's okay. That's okay. It sounded gonna, good. What's let, let me? Uh, so, what's the inspiration for a lot of your music? I mean, where do you put? Where do you mine? What do you mine? Uh, is it your surroundings? Is it politics? Is it love? Is it all of the above? It's it's really all of the above. And I was talking about this yesterday with a friend of mine who gave me the idea for a song called The Ragged Edge of Moderation. And uh, <laughs> I've so never good. heard that term before, but I might work on that one. Um, the last song I wrote actually is called Mother Winter. I just finished it yesterday. The inspiration for that was I was explaining to a real good friend of mine in Maine that uh, Montana is so beautiful and uh, because it's it's protected by winter. Um you know, if there were, if you guys had a California climate here, you'd have you'd have a hundred million people living here. Right. And this friend of mine said exact same thing for the coast of Maine. Can you imagine Maine, which is one of the most glorious places in right. the world? Can you imagine Maine with California weather? It would be completely ruined. So Mother mm. Winter really protects some absolutely beautiful places. Um, so that's that that's that inspired me, but. Uh, all kinds of life stories, you know, and sure. things people say to me inspire me. So, so you're you're a singer songwriter. You're performing down in Key West. Why'd you get in the bar business? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, do you want the whole food chain from the from the time they walk in to the time they well, listen to you? Kind of my uh, yearly schedule is I don't like to tour on the road uh, November through. February or March. It's just, it's too problematic with winter. And right. uh, so I usually stayed pretty close to Key West and, and played at a, at a couple of regular places there. Friends of mine, were, uh, my friend, Charlie Bauer, who owned the Key West Songwriters Festival, the largest key, largest songwriters festival in the world. He had managed a very successful club for 25 years. He wanted to open his own place. He put some investors together and, uh, talked to me and, uh, and I had a, a very little money lying around and uh, i said well I'd, I'd like to be involved in this and uh it's, it's been a great thing we've been open almost five years we host the biggest songwriters festival in the in the world and it's a very music oriented club we have two acts a day 365 days a year wow. so it's kind of like my little branson when i'm in when i'm in key west i don't i can do five shows a week and i don't have to go on the road and there's a different audience every week Coming it's, through because so it's, it's such a tour, and my, tourist destination. Yeah, and my fan base, a lot of them tend to come to Key West for a week, a lot in the winter. So every week is a different group of people that I've played for all over the. And so at, at the smoking, so the smoking tuna saloon. It's a saloon, saloon. It's got. Or it's a restaurant. And it's a restaurant. how big's the venue? The, the uh, for we, we performance. Can, we seat. We got a big stage. We seat about 150 people. But uh, songwriters festival, they take all the furniture out, and we can get. Four or five hundred people now, in there. Tell me, give me. I have my my my, my uh, mile markers down in Key West. Uh, uh, Captain Tony's. Ah, uh, yes. Right. Okay, Captain Tony's and Rick's. So where are you in uh, relation we to are, these? If you went, there's a, there's this little lane behind Rick's called the Telegraph Lane. Yes. And we're 
we're on the corner of Televac, Telegraph Lane and Charles Street. Okay. So we're one block, we're a half a block off Duval. And you walk into a place, it's a big property, three buildings surrounding this huge courtyard, big stage, two bars, kitchen, uh, merchandise shop. And um, so it's become a destination. You know, we don't That's get great. people stumbling in off Duval Street, but we, it's people go in there knowing it's a music. We've got a, right. we've got a great sound system. We've got the sound man there so, all the time. And, so you have the biggest songwriting festival in the country, right? Uh, they say it's in the world, actually. Really? 175 the, songwriters. And do you, get, do, you, uh, do you hear songs that inspire you? Or do you hear songs that you want to record or... You know what kind of what kind of you know visceral reaction do you have to well, you know, see what's going it, this, on? This is going to be the twenty first annual. I think I played it about fourteen or 15, 15 of them. It's very much uh, a Nashville event. It, mm-hmm. it, BMI is one of the main sponsors, so they bring down amazing artists, and it's kind of a reward trip for all their great writers. And I've never really been a, a country commercial writer. I took right. a stab at it a right. few years ago, and it just didn't seem to fit with me being from the Northeast and. But I, I learn a lot the craftsmanship of these these folks that write all these, you know, these country hits. And but Robert Earl Keen plays at our club every year, and Gary Clark Jr. played there sure. last. I mean, we get some amazing people on our stage. Not to mention, do you know people. Charlie Feldman? I, I've met Charlie. Yeah, Charlie's yeah. Charlie Charlie Feldman's a VP of songwriting over at BMI, one of the yes. rights organizations. He's a he takes care of everybody. He's a good friend of Dominic Kinesi's. Right, a really good friend. Oh, of I, I listened to that show. <laughs> you did right? <laughs> yes. No, because I know Charlie. I remember Charlie from back in New York. And they're talking about supporting songwriters and what BMI does and these types of things they do yes. in Key West or in Nashville or wherever New York. That's what it's about. At the end of the I day, I mean, yeah. what's interesting in, in your career to me is that you perform with and are you know rubbing shoulders with some of the other great. Songwriters, obviously Jimmy Buffett, you know Livingston Taylor, Carol King, who's turned out what oh. hundreds of songs. I love you know, Carol from, King. You know, from uh, you know she started out in New York City, you know, at the at the mecca of songwriting, and her and mm. what Jerry Coffin and you know wrote and, and about all. one of the nicest human human beings ever walked. Up. I've played a gig with her, and I actually saw her two years ago because they, she was on tour with James Taylor, and my good friend Russ Kunkel was playing sure. drums, and he produced one of my records, and. And I ended up having dinner now, with them before. Russ the show. Kunkel was a drummer for. I, I can't, was was he a drummer for uh, Billy Joel? Was well, he that started one out with he and he and Leland Sklar started out with James Taylor. They right. had their own band in L.A. And right. then, they, then Sweet Baby James was the first record right. they. I remember that played record. on. But then he was with Linda Ronst to play with Linda Ronst, Jackson Brown. Uh, he's Is played he part with of the Wrecking Crew. No, it was the what was the the, the section was the name of their the band. Section, the yeah. section. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the name of his. Yeah, they were they were they. He and Leland Sklar. By the way, you met you. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jackson uh, Brown, one of my favorites. Did you see at the um, memorial to uh, Glenn Frey, he sang with the Eagles and took Glenn's oh, place in it. I and didn't it see that. Seemed to fit in very nicely with. Him. Yeah, he was wow. a big inspiration for them. I think. Yeah, sure, because he wrote some of the songs like "Take It Easy" yes. and, and some of the other ones for uh, the Eagles. Well, you're listening to What Do You Know with Scott Narnie. We have Scott Kirby. We are so fortunate to have him in the studio today. This is just a real treat for us. You're our first music guest. I'm honored. You are, well, uh, <laughs> certainly playing in the studio, correct? Right. Exactly. The first one that's coming. <laughs> Narnie and I play our vocal cords. And <laughs> no. No, Scott's, uh, you know, one of my favorites. Eight, eight albums. I want, I want to hear another song from you, though, because will you do Lucky Enough? Sure. Will you do that for it's me? Good to- yeah, tune on this thing. I'm in a weird tuning. That's right. Just weird we're, tune it. And don't worry, we're not. We are live. We are live here, <laughs> so you can tune it, and we can get you another microphone over here. I have and the I, good I wanna... sense to bring a tuner because this is uh, you did. It's amazing we're... how we can't tune a guitar by ear as we get older. I've... That's. I was in a little dad gad tuning there. Somehow yeah, where do you how do you find where do you buy guitar strings here in Montana? You have to go to Missoula, oh. actually. That's probably <laughs> well. I live uh, there's a great guitar shop in Bozeman. Is there? Yes, Music Villa. Yeah, great. One of the nicest guitar shops I've ever seen, actually. That's no surprise. Yeah, phenomenal. Are you playing in Bozeman at all? Do you? You know, I don't. Uh, I do a charity event every year or two in Livingston for the food pantry, mm-hmm. and this is kind of my oasis away from when I come out here. I'm either writing or. Right. Just done 25 shows in 31 nights, so I, I haven't really, you know, got into playing a lot of shows out here because I'm usually kind of resting and uh, 
But no, oh. I haven't done a lot of shows in, in, in Montana. Well, you are in music. You are in the music city of Montana. Missoula certainly is. Between our Wilma Theater and um, the Top Hat and the University and the Big Sky in the summer at the Big Sky Brewing, they have an outdoor festival. We have, you know, we attract some great artists and they come, they actually will reroute to come through Missoula just because they know it's such a special love place being to here, be. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a beautiful place. And what we're also doing, interestingly enough, fits in the tantrums. Um, the drummer actually just did a thing over at the Wilma where he was actually doing music education for young kids. And he was showing kids like, you know, what it meant to be part, you know, be a musician, to be a songwriter and kind of really gave a peek into your world. But for young people. So it wasn't just, you know, a right, paying gig. Right, right. It was he wants to pay it forward. So uh that's what's good about Missoula. Missoula's music. I'm going to go to the uh, theater tonight, actually, and see uh, Jeff Bridges play. Yeah, oh, he's one in down. Down. That's yeah. right. So for our listeners, the pleasure of listening to Scott Kirby doing Lucky Enough. All right. That I ain't done nothing. That I ain't good much. But this rumor is smiling. Doctor, my lawyer say you're no talk to wear, and you can't keep up keeping this pace. As the shadows grow longer and the north wind blows stronger, it's a struggle to sing out my turn. You can't live your life with the luck of the Irish without knowing life breaks your heart. If you live in to love by the ocean You're loving to live by the sea Lucky enough to live on blue water You're lucky enough by me Sure to sure salesman all of my life Selling stories and songs By the case And old Fred He said if you're not On the edge You're taking up way too much Space And I've taken chances And suffered the glances Of those fools Where their feet are on the land I'll raise my glass You can kiss my land I'll die with my feet in the sand If you're living to love by the ocean You're loving to live by the sea Lucky enough to live on blue water You're lucky enough by me If you're living to love by the ocean you're loving to live by the sea Lucky enough to live on blue water You're lucky enough by me Beautiful. Thank you. Boy, we are lucky. That makes me want to go sailing. Man, I didn't, that does. So what I'm kind of what, yeah, and what kind of what kind of uh, boat you have these days? I have a Frere's Thirty up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's a uh, designed by uh, oh, it's, it's, it's the man that designed all the old Frere's. There's his name, obviously. He designed <laughs> all the uh, the uh, Swans. So it's a kind of a racing cruiser, and it's nice. Uh, yeah, I have a partner up there, and we have a great time with it. By the way, his his New England accent barely comes through these days. You've been down in Florida long enough. When I get drinking the whiskey in Boston, it, it comes <laughs> roaring back. <laughs> so you've put you fashioned a pretty nice life for yourself, Scott. You get a chance to hang out in Key West. You get to go up to New England. You're now uh, involved uh, with a lady friend here in Montana. Yes. And, so you get the, you know, he's got the best of uh, three coasts already. He really does. It's pretty coast. good. The third coast. I was speaking with someone in Key West recently, and uh, 
he said, where do you go when you're not here? And I said, well, we have a house in Maine. And then uh, I said, my girlfriend lives in Montana. So I kind of go Key West, Maine to Montana. He, he looks at me with real anger in his face. <laughs> well, why don't you get a place in Hawaii too? How about that? <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. He wasn't just, happy. Just stick a stake through my heart and, you know, just. No, I, I am. I am so lucky. And, and music's and music's been the thing that's really is taking you to these great places. Not obviously Montana, but uh, well, hey, Montana too. Montana music. too. I, I the reason I came to Montana was through music. Uh, is that right? Yes, uh, uh, I never been to Montana until about five or six years ago. My friend uh, named Dink Bruce from Key West has summered here for forty years, and his father was Ernest Hemingway's assistant, Toby Bruce. He's a wow. real interesting guy. Um, so I come through Livingston five years, five or six years ago. About three years ago, a crowd was sitting in my club in Key West, and they were from Livingston. And it turned out the woman had founded the food pantry there in Livingston. And she mm-hmm. said, would you ever come to our town and do a benefit? And I said, well, I happen to know in June I'm coming through Boise, and then I'm going to stop in Livingston. So I said, no one knows me in Montana, but if, if I can help in any way, I'll have my van with all my gear and I'd be glad to play for you, but no one knows who I am there. And anyway, I ended up coming out and doing this charity event in Livingston oh, three nice. years ago. And that's how I ended up kind of connecting with all these wonderful people in Livingston. And So tell me, so you, so you take a van, um, how do you travel and where do you travel? I, uh, the last, I would say seven or eight years, I do about 35 states. I'm in th- about 35 states between, mm-hmm. between April and, uh, and October. And I mean, I go out for three weeks, four weeks at a time, and then I'll take two weeks off. But I just have a regular uh, van. I do a lot of the tour with a lead guitar player. Mm-hmm. On the East Coast, where I'm uh, better known, I play a lot of venues with a band. And then some things, I'll just go out and play real small songwriter club solo. So I have a real mix of... And you have an agent that's that's actually... I have an assistant who's been with, uh, with me and agent. Peter Mayer, a Jimmy Buffett's lead guitar player, for 15 years, and she helps me with a lot of this. And uh, ah. um, But you know club owners across the country. I I'm do, sure. and now, now, strangely, house concerts have been... when the Yes. Right. Someone asked me to do a house concert seven or eight years ago. It sounded like the oddest... Combination. Thing, the, Go over to somebody's yeah, house and, and it perform. Did, it seemed really strange, and um, then I started doing them and you know it's for it's it's definitely a thing you wouldn't bring a band to it's a solo thing but these some of these folks just love you know having 70s 80 people i saw that kanye and- west just did somebody's bar mitzvah <laughs> really in new york really god knows what they paid them but yeah. can you imagine that a million dollars <laughs> yeah. yes it starts sure. at a million Be the, meanwhile they have a jazz uh, there's a guy here by the university who hosts a house concert every quarter i think really? and he brings in beautiful great jazz musicians and i was at it maybe uh, right over over the holidays and exactly your point it's just people who love music and you pay a little bit to, you know you pay something to go there yeah but you have a meal and you're you have real access to the musician the musicians and it's a great appreciation and some folks now have they buy their own sound systems they have about 10 of these a year that so, right so people That's fly crazy. in and you know they have 70 people and they pay 20 or 25 dollars a piece That's and crazy. the money goes to the artist and it's the, everyone's listening it's you know and, and they uh, put them up at the house they so they don't have any overhead costs yeah in terms of put them up hotels. at the house or they have a hotel for them very close by With and trade we should think about that here for Montana, right. okay? You know, Missoula, Arnie. We should think about house uh, house concerts because it really is the way to actually for music people and pre- people who appreciate music to really get a firsthand look on what it takes. And- Scott, you've been in the music business now a pretty long time. What, what are the things that have changed a lot? I remember in the old days when I talked to uh, artists, they would they wouldn't perform until they got paid. Because of uh, how th- how things were structured, and they wanted to be sure they got their right. money up front. Has that is has that changed much in, in these in 20, days? In uh, twenty eight years of doing this yes. full time, I have uh, occasionally asked to uh, for, to be have a deposit on a show, right. but I I typically not. Right, and I've only been stiffed once in twenty eight years. That's a pretty good record. Where? So North we Car- don't have to go North there. Carolina. North Carolina. <laughs> oh, so the state or a particular city in the state? Oh, God, it was near. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. But it, it was a sad situation. The, the, the person who owned the club had that's been blasphemous. gone through a tragedy. And, and uh, it was, it's, you know, that's, that's the worst that's thing pathetic. that ever happens you to me. You have to pay the musician. That's the whole. That's the yeah, best. of course. Yeah. That's the way it the, works. The biggest thing that's changed for bank. me as, as a crew. small artist is that, you know, you don't get the revenue 
10 or 12 years ago, I, you know, put $30,000 into a CD or $20,000 into a CD and, you know, you sell, you know, a few thousand right away and, and you've got your investment back immediately and then you're, you're making money two weeks later and now with iTunes, that's that's not just with the small people. Like that's with everyone, you know. Sure. C- well, but you don't have to schlep CDs anymore, or not as many. I yeah, I still do fairly well on the road with them, but they don't sell online. Like what do you sell them for? What's the price? Fifteen and uh, fifteen. Pete Mayer and I just did a double length live CD that we're selling for twenty five. But yeah, we we sell them for fifteen and. Well, you're li- well, let me let me just back in out. We were listening to Scott Kirby here on What Do You Know? Um, and question, how do people get your CD um, online? How do I they a, find you? Yeah, ScottKirby.com. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's I, a good I, website I you lost in there. enough to get that one early, yes. Are you on and, Facebook, too? I have a Facebook page, Scott Kirby, with no space between my name. but uh, K-A-R-B-I-B-Y. Yeah, K-A-R-B-Y. And then... Uh, but yeah, my website is uh, scottkirby.com. Go there and you can sign up for my newsletter and you'll know if I'm coming anywhere near you in the next five or six months or you can order any of my, my CDs. Or So the closest you've come to Montana, other than when you did that gig in um, Livingston, I guess, was uh, Boise? Did you ever? Um, my sister lives in Boise and I've, I've played in Boise three or four times and I played years ago in North Dakota. I play in uh, Minneapolis, so I play around that. I'm in that neck of the woods for a couple of weeks in you ever July. You get up to Canada. I, my grandparents are from Newfoundland, actually. So ah, okay. I have Canadian roots, and I am playing a couple things up near Toronto. This well, there are a couple summer. of good venues here in town. The Top Hat is one you might get to the see. Wilma. When the Wilma, you'll be at tonight uh, when you get to see uh, Jeff Bridges and the Abiders perform. Where else? I mean, there are a bunch Top of Hat would be a good place for uh, Scott to perform here. It would be. Well, I'll have to. I'll check it out. Oh, that's uh, good. You know, it's also interesting is that when we talk about music and we talk about kind of how you expose your music, so online, everything's changed, right? You're on the road. You're able to promote your CDs. Have you ever uh, dabbled or people from film or television looked at any of your compositions? Uh, have you ever submitted them to supervisors or music supervisors? I have not done a, a lot of that. Um, I, I, you know, I do 150 shows a year, and I'm, I just haven't been good at exploring that part of the industry and uh um it's an interesting part of the industry because what, what i remember in the 90s it we used to do singer songwriter showcases at sundance oh and yeah and at um, all these film festivals and we used to bring in the directors and the supervisors and they would hear new tracks or new new compositions from up and coming as well as established artists and they would place them in film and that believe it or not is a, a lucrative channel sure. of revenue that otherwise of course he has what a lot of people don't have which is his own venue to perform in which is really great to have he has his own venue in the winter yeah to be able to play i mean i could always play four or five shows a week down there in the winter at, at a couple of places like jimmy buffett's club for one but to play at our own venue is you know I, i'll go down and do 15 shows in three weeks then i'll you know get out of town for a couple of weeks so it's a it's a good it's a good mix for me and then i'm on the road you know six months off and on so beautiful we should get that song, his Montana song, to the uh, tourism board. Yeah. Well, that's a. I recorded it uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, at this beautiful theater when I was on tour with Peter. I'll, I'll get the track of that and send it out to you guys. Good. We'll be happy yeah, to help professionally you professionally. We would love we, that, Do we have time for to do one more song Absolutely. before we end? Do you, pick, pick one that you think you uh, like our listeners would uh, like to hear. I've I've already How about made whiskey you. Whiskey has turned my life around. I like that one. That's a good one. I agree. We yeah. didn't delve into that side of being in a bar every day, but we'll we'll leave that for another show. Well, this is a true sto- true story. The funny thing about this is, um, I went to Scotland five or six years ago, and I'd never had never drank whiskey, and I had the sense to stay away from it. And I had some fine scotch when I was over there, and I I came back and. Uh, you know, I'd have a couple of whiskeys now and then, and a very moderate whiskey drinker most of the time. Right. And it turned my life around, so. <laughs> Good. Used to live my life so wrong, we're going to rum and tequila all night long. Beer battered and rotten on the vine, I was a lone man down bad case of wine moving slow with that morning flu oh lord what's a man to do have whiskey it's turned my life around yes
yes it has That whiskey For that golden brown I tried to quit I quit, quit I went to AA one day I ended up in LACA D-R-U-N-K Then a lightning struck on a beautiful May The miracle curator came my way That whiskey it's turned my life around, yeah. That whiskey, that golden brown. So sad, such a crime So much whiskey, so little time Ain't nothing so sweet in the whole wide world Scotch on the lips of a beautiful girl Now I'm up real early The crack of nine The bright blue eyes The gin clear mind Look at me, Mr. Moderation Drinking my way through the United Nations In Ireland, Scotland, Canada too Oh Lord, what's a man to do? That whiskey, it's turned my life around. Yeah. That whiskey, that golden brown. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> That'd be a good song for Montana. That's Scott Kirby. Scott Kirby. Um, what do you know? Arnie, we've been blessed. This was a good one. It's been a pleasure to see you after all this time, and thank you for coming on the show. And you can be a guest here anytime you're in town. Well, thank you so much. The, the pleasure is mine. Believe me. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Scott Kirby. What do you know on KGVO? ScottKirby.com and on Facebook. All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming. <laughs>